Hello and welcome. I'm Benjamin Story. I'm a senior fellow here at the American Enterprise Institute in the Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies Division. And I'm joined by John Agresto. And we'll be talking today about his new book called The Death of Learning. Uh, this event is part of the Edward and Helen Hintz Book Forum series, which is AEI's um, AEI series, which is designed to bring together uh, leading thinkers and scholars to discuss pressing issues in American politics, public policy, and culture. All of us at AEI are very grateful to Edward and Helen Hintz for their generous support and deep, deep commitment to our mission. Our guest today, again, is uh, John Agresto. John Agresto has taught at many colleges and universities, including the University of Toronto, Kenyon College, and Duke University. He has been a scholar in residence at uh, any number of institutions of um, higher research, including Princeton University and the National Humanities Center. He has served as the deputy director for the National Endowment for the Humanities and for 11 years as president of St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico. After that, he served as dean, provost, and chancellor of the American University of Iraq at Suleimani. Uh, Dr. Agresto is uh, the author of five books, including the one that we're going to be talking about today, which is called The Death of Learning, How American Education Has Failed Our Students and What to Do About It. John Agresto, welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. This is very sweet of you. So the real subject of this book is liberal education or the liberal arts. And given the, the confusion and even unfamiliarity that seems to me to have come to surround those terms, liberal education and the liberal arts, I think we had better begin at the beginning. That is, what are the liberal arts? Why do you care about them? And why should anyone else? I thought we only had an hour. <laughs> Uh, in fact, I get the question asked in a, in, a more sh in a sharper way by people who say, how come they call it the liberal arts? Say, well, why don't they call it the conservative arts? Yeah. Uh, and, but therein lies a tale, uh, because uh, we'll talk in a, in a little bit about the liberal arts as, as the liberating arts. Uh, but at the same time, quite paradoxically, they are the conserving arts. Hmm. This is where culture, tradition, uh, great books find their, find their home. So it's an odd thing. People who say, you know, uh, uh, and in fact the left thinks of the liberal arts these days, or as it used to be, as very reactionary, very conservative, uh, uh, very hidebound, very Western. Uh, and, the, and the right thinks of it as nothing but a bunch of woke activists. Uh, and so why, this is a hard question to answer when you're faced mm -hmm. with these kinds of, uh, kinds of difficulties. Uh, you say, where did it start? Uh, I mean, if you go back to, you know, to, the, to the Greeks, to Seneca, to Cicero, I mean, they talked about the, 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 the liberal arts, uh, and they, they meant it in, a, in an odd kind of way. It was, it was distinct from the servile arts. Mm -hmm. Now, we would no more call the opposite of the liberal arts, the servile arts these days. Uh, uh, but what it meant was uh, uh, these were the arts that were fit for free men, and they were men, uh, boys, uh, uh, who had, didn't have to work, uh, who could enjoy uh, learning rhetoric and could delve into mathematics and can look at, look at science and, and read and write poetry. Uh, as time went on, uh, we stopped calling them the servile arts, the opposite. Uh, uh, except I always, when I want to praise vocational, technical, professional education, I sometimes do say they're the arts of service. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that distinguishes it in a very fine way, in a nice way, in a pleasant way for them from the liberal arts, which uh, seem to say, uh, and this is a problem with the liberal arts, that we don't serve. We, uh, we, 
as, a, as one of my colleagues at Kenyon once gave a, a very good talk, a very wrong-headed talk, uh, uh, liberal arts, the arts of the management of privacy. Huh. The management of privacy, you know, they are interdirected. They're not for anybody else. They, they're, they're uh, you know, uh, Machiavelli putting on his smoking jacket or whatever. It wasn't that. And, and, and communing with, with, the, with the great Roman authors. Uh, uh, we, have, we have gone beyond that, I think. That may have been the beginning of the liberal arts. Uh, for men who were free and who needn't work and needn't serve, but be served. And it became, in time, uh, the liberal arts not for free men, but the liberal arts that make men and women free. They are the arts that generate a kind of independence of thought and imagination uh, so that you are, not, uh, you are not simply at the behest of, of, not always, of others, of the culture directly, of opinion, that in fact you could you could, uh, it's not me, I swear it's not me. Uh, uh, you could uh, uh, be free of, uh, or begin to be free of the cave of, a, you know, of opinion that you live in and see some glimmer of what might be true, of what the arguments are that, you're, that you're, your compatriots don't know about. Uh, and you can become a person who thinks for himself or herself. So the liberal arts are, in a sense, uh, something that grew out of the, the education of free men to now being the education that might make us, as men and women, uh, freer. Uh, teach us to think for ourselves, imagine for ourselves, uh, and ask why. Always ask why. Now, we have, that's a very high highfalutin answer to what the liberal arts are. When you to, otherwise, the liberal arts tend to be Though, we've, since we've divided up learning into, into fields and disciplines, it tend to be things like literature, history, philosophy, the classics, uh, the sciences. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we always tend to think of the liberal arts as humanities, but they're more than humanities. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's the beginning of an answer. I don't know. It is. I, I want to. Uh, return to this 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 remark from which began distinguishing uh, the liberal arts from the servile arts in the sense that the liberal arts do not have any immediate utility right now our country <clears throat> is a country that loves utility we're a famously practical people Alexis de Tocqueville both sort of celebrates and worries about this tremendous American mm -hmm. pragmatism at the same time, we have been described, I think aptly, as a land of colleges. It's like an old American formula as, you're, as we're crossing the continent. You, you sort of, you, you clear the forest so you can farm, you build a few houses, then you build a church, and then you build a college. The, and this is, this happens- Followed often by an opera house. The, right, right, right. The, and this is, this is, uh, this is, the, but this is an amazing thing that such a pragmatic people would think that it needed to bring colleges wherever it went. Yeah. So uh, why do we do that? We, it's a great mystery in some ways because even the colleges we built were not particularly themselves liberal arts colleges, although mm -hmm. they had aspects of it. They were based by and large religious institutions. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, and uh, the, uh, the ministers and the, and the priests and the bishops and, and uh, always thought that it, uh, they knew there was a danger in what we call liberal education because mm -hmm. it, you know, it does lead to questioning and thinking and you mm -hmm. know, asking, well, make an account of yourself, father mm -hmm. or sister or pastor. Uh, and, uh, uh, but they also knew that they needed intelligent Christians Mm -hmm. Intel and, and the same would be for, for Hebrew schools. We need intelligent leaders of, of, of our congregation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, so not all the liberal arts as we know it, 
but that there would be people who would who would think about uh, theology, not mm -hmm. just not just belief, but think about the the philosophic aspects of religion. Think about philosophy. Think about uh, even some ways history, uh, the the lives of the saints and the lives of great martyrs mm -hmm. and the uh, and the history of the Reformation and, and the disputes. So all all that was there. Uh, mm -hmm. But you're right. We uh, we but we've had an odd relationship as a nation with uh, with liberal education. Uh, even the Constitution praises education, but it's the education and the practical and maritime arts, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and when uh, I, 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 when I, I thought it was Jefferson when he started the University of Virginia, but it, it may it may not it may not have been may have been another college university uh, had a tough time. Uh, setting up a uh, a college that would had no trouble setting up a college devoted to uh, distilling and shipbuilding <laughs> and uh, maritime arts uh, had a hard time setting up a college of, that would teach Greek and Latin uh -huh. because the trustees said we don't we don't cotton to that stuff okay. we're Americans we look forward we don't look back so. Now this is uh, this is very interesting because Thomas Jefferson clearly thought uh, the establishment of both the practical arts and the liberal arts was crucial mm -hmm. to the political project of the American nation, and I think he was not alone in thinking this. I think George Washington, for example, had similar ideas. Why would those great Americans think that this country, in particular, had a special need for the liberal arts? And they did think that. Uh, I mean, why does you know Madison go back to Princeton to learn Hebrew? Ah. Uh, uh, don't you know enough? No, I have to know. <laughs> <laughs> have to know a little bit more. Uh, uh, look at what they accomplished with their knowledge. I mean, you can't read the Federalist Papers without mm -hmm. saying. Who are these people? I mean, from from Pericles to Demosthenes to Cicero to the uh, uh, to the uh, 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 Amphictonic League to the uh, you know, they knew every bit of history. Mm -hmm. What they mostly looked at were histories of confederacies mm -hmm. and histories of republics. Mm -hmm. uh, they needed to know both what to be and what to avoid, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, ancient history gave them that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they weren't satisfied with taking other people's words for what Cicero might say. They all knew Latin, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, not George Washington, uh, but all the others pretty much knew Latin, uh, and, uh, and, and Greek, and as I said, even Hebrew. Uh, uh, the, you know, I hope we talk at some point about multiculturalism, yes. but, the, but the, the important part about what they were doing was they didn't see Western civilization as this long advanced growth, organic growth. They actually saw it as, a, as, as breaks, as mm -hmm. things that changed, as great, as great uh, uh, revolutions in a sense. And they wanted to know why is it, if we want to be a republic, and we had to be a republic, how do we do it so that we will, as Lincoln says, it's easy to establish, the question is whether it can survive. Mm -hmm. uh, how can we make a republic that will survive with these characteristics that we want? Uh, uh -huh. and, uh, uh, and for that, they had to go back and look at, at Pericles in Athens, they had to go back and look at the Roman Republic, they had to go back and look at the fall of the Roman Republic. They had a, uh, the Montesquieu was a big deal, uh, and they had to look there at, 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 uh, at Geneva and, and, uh, and Paris and all the, all the, all the places that, that gave a kind of republic that was not the kind we could be. Mm. Well, what, did, what was their characteristic as opposed to ours? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that Madison could even say in, in, uh, in 17, I forget now the final date it was, that, that what we put together here was a, a system without precedent, ancient no. or modern. Uh, uh, but they could only say that because they knew, they knew the alternatives. They knew what the great alternatives were, and they knew what made republics live, and especially what made them die. Mm. Uh, so this is why they thought it was important to be liberally educated.
So you seem to be saying something that liberal artists often avoid saying, or in fact often explicitly reject. You seem to be saying that the liberal arts are useful. Oh, that, yeah, 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 let's talk about that. They, they, are, they, are, they are useful, <clears throat> if I can put words in your mouth, both personally and politically. Does that seem... Yeah, accept? in fact, even broad and politically, it's useful. it's useful for the society, for the culture, for the civilization. Uh, I mean, the, uh, isn't, isn't this a marvelous thing? That the liberal arts could teach you how to be smarter about things that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, could teach you uh, uh, stories, heighten your imagination, give you, as, as, uh, as Charnwood said about Lincoln, he read to find out what models of human life could be. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so they could really help you as an individual. And at the same time, as the founders knew, uh, or as Witherspoon, I, I mention him in the book here, Witherspoon says to the, to the graduates of, uh, of Princeton, or maybe it was the incoming class, don't live life, uh, don't live and die useless and be contemptible. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, we don't give we don't give uh, uh, graduation speeches like that much anymore. <laughs> and we probably should. Uh, uh, and by I think you meant contemptible. Don't 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 live in your shell. Don't be just for you. You got a country here. You got a, we're founding a country. And you know, I even gave a list of of all the people who heard Witherspoon say these things. You know, half the people or a third of the people at the federal convention, uh, any number of senators, any number of representatives, Supreme Court justices, James Madison. I mean, the list goes on and on of people who said, uh, "I'm not going to be, I'm not going to live uselessly and die contemptible. I'm going to live for myself." And the better I am, the more knowledgeable I am, the more the more better uh, uh, my society will be, my country will be, my culture will be. Uh, and, and I actually, if I could go on a little bit more on this, uh, I, I wanted to end there. And then as we go, the founding was, I, I, in fact, I even once wrote an essay on, on America, the first liberal arts nation. Ah. Uh, and, uh, uh, but then I said, you know, but who cares? That was back then, you know, so the founders were liberally educated. And I said, uh, and they set up a republic where, where, uh, where we're not ruled by kings or priests, we rule ourselves. Wait a minute, we rule ourselves. Do we not have to have some of the qualities that the founders had? Yes. Because we're rulers. Uh, what, what qualities do you want your co-rulers to have in this country? You want them to be stupid? You want them to be... Uh, uh, or uneducated. I mean, you can't help being stupid, but you can help being uneducated. Uh, uh, do you want them not to know anything about the history of their country, uh, uh, the sacrifices of people who lived and died for the country, not know anything about the foundations of the country, why we're this way and not that way? Not only think about the reasons why things are the way they are or what's set up the way they are. I mean, do, do we really want fellow citizens to be that uneducated about things that really matter? What happens is, well, I think we see around us what happens. Hmm. Let me not go any further. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, so, I think you make a, a good case for the usefulness. Yeah. But I also, uh, I, what you'll find is how, how strange it is that everybody tells me in the book, I really have great respect for the technical and vocational and professional arts. Yes. Uh, I mean, they really are, you can, you can call them servile, but they really do, uh, some of them are very high arts. To be a doctor, uh, is, uh, you know, to be an engineer, uh, to be an architect. I mean, you have to know not only things that are wonderful to know, uh, but you have to know things that people want you to know and you, uh, you, that people need. They, you know, a, a good plumber is worth a hell of a lot more than, let me not say anything more than that. Uh, uh, 
and, uh, and, uh, and, and we say, oh, they're only in it for the money. Well, that's kind of cynical, stupid uh, talk. Uh, some of them, of course, are in it for the money. No one ever says professors are in it for the money. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it really is cynical and, and hollow talk to say that about, about great professional people and great technical people and tradesmen. I mean, the delicatessen owner is there to sell you good food that he's proud of. He's not there to make a, yeah, he makes a buck, he has to, but, uh, but he's there to feed you. The farmer is there to feed you. Uh, and uh, uh, there's, there's a wonderful little piece I have in the book by Booker T. Washington, where he says, you know, the person who uh, grows the cabbage has to know, he doesn't put it in exactly these terms, he has to know about earth science, he has to know something about meteorology, uh, he has to know about, about uh, fertilization. He has to know something about plant genetics. Uh, he has to know if he wants to sell it, he has to know something about how to figure and add and subtract. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he says, you know, uh, no, and the result is when he looks at a leaf of cabbage, he sees in it an, infinite, an infinity of wonder, just in a leaf of cabbage. And, uh, and he says, you know, there's more in a leaf of cabbage than there is in a page of Latin. And I, that's probably true. Uh, so I would never, I'm, so I, if I called, if I say they're the arts of service or the arts of, of, uh, of production, uh, 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 I'm praising them for that. Well, I think it, John makes a, a great case for the, um, the useful arts in the course of the death of learning. And uh, I think you're, you're right about that. But of course, the useful arts are not in decline. And the liberal arts are. You cite a dramatic statistic that these residential liberal arts colleges that dot the landscape that we were talking about just a little while ago, they have, those colleges now educate only 5% of American students. The liberal arts ideal is getting an increasingly cold shoulder from the American public. What are the causes of the decline? I mean, you put your finger on it before. We're a practical people, and, uh, and uh, well, let me put it, the, the, the answer the professors always give, it's, it's the fault of the damn parents. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Joey, what are you, gonna, you got a major in literature? What the hell are you gonna do with the literature? Well, become, an, you know, become an engineer, become a doctor, become a, anything, but don't become a poet. God Almighty, uh, and uh, and uh, and then the kids say it themselves. You know, I can't have to have my parents spend two hundred thousand dollars on my education for me to study medieval history. Uh, you know, I think I'll I think I'll give them a better return on their money and become a fill in the blank, whatever it is. Uh, uh, and then what else is causing the decline? Colleges and universities and. Uh, uh, university college presidents like me and Nori, you know, we go out and say, you know, you gotta, we got to raise money. We got to raise a lot of money. We can't raise it, so we, we, we put it on the backs of students and their parents. Mm. And we charge as much for a degree in English literature where all the books, if they're, if they're still reading books in English, uh, are, are, you know, hardly have copyrights on them anymore. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're charging as much for that as we're charging for, for petroleum engineering classes. Uh, and so the kids go, uh, students go uh, to college, to university, and basically they're subsidizing the, the, the education of people who will make four, five, six times what they make upon graduation. Uh, it's an insane way of, of running, running a, a country, a world. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I, I don't want this book to be an obituary. It's not that. Uh, there are lots of things in, going on that are, that are hopeful, uh, and, uh, and we can talk about that too. I, I, I want to talk about the hopeful things in just a moment, but I, I have to, while we're talking about the causes of the decline, I have to cite to you a line that you quote in the book from your own teacher, uh, Alan Bloom. Uh, and you say that he would describe the, uh, the liberal arts as the solvent that dissolves convention, the hammer that smashes all idols, and the power that will liberate our minds from the tyranny of parents, poets, and priests. 
And look, I, I loved The Closing of the American Mind when I first read it as a young man. But this seems to me totally over the top. And, uh, oh, it's not over the top. I mean, he had three, he had three Ps in there, parents, poets, priests. He forgot professors. <laughs> we gotta, we got to smash their rule, too. Uh, but is this part of the problem that not just, you know, here, Bloom, who's usually identified with the right, is, is of a piece with many college professors on the left who pit themselves against, uh, like poets, priests, and, and parents. And the tyranny of those, it's, uh, you know, as a, just as a, my dad wasn't a tyrant. The, and I think that's probably the attitude of a lot of people who, who see this. Like, I, no, I, I'm not going to, you know, uh, as a parent, I'm not going to pay you to, you know, to, 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 to take the, son of, the soul of my son or daughter away from me. Or, and as a child, I just don't know that that many children experience these other authorities in their lives as tyrannical. No, I think you're right. Uh, and, and Bloom was, of course, the, the paradigmatic example of someone who, was, who seemed to be very conservative but he was, was really a, a smasher of all idols. Yes. Uh, and, and he would even say, I, I, I love it when I get kids who come from Catholic colleges uh, to, to Cornell University. Uh, of course, they have something we can fight against. They have something they could rebel against. Mm. They, they, uh, people who grow up in, in, in agnostic families, well, they don't give a damn. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, uh, so yes, he, he really was that radical. And I say in there, conservatives praised the book without ever realizing the radicalness of it. But the other, but the other part, of, part of Bloom, and I, I do, I love Bloom. I think he, I thought he was one of, probably, if not the smartest man I ever met, maybe one of the two or three smartest people I ever met. Uh, but, uh, uh, but he really reduced all of the liberal arts just to philosophy. Yes. Uh, and, and the liberal arts are so much more than just philosophy. Uh, and uh, I remember when he, uh, I talked to him about what I would do, and I told him I was studying with Walter Burns. And he was always very, uh, he was always friendly to me. He, he helped me get my first job. Uh, but he was also critical. He says, oh, I guess you're only fit for American things. <laughs> wow, uh, the, uh, Walter Burns, by the way, was a um, was an AEI scholar. I know that. The, um, I know that, and, and a wonderful teacher. He might have been number two on the hit parade of, of most intelligent people I knew. So, uh, so Bloom goes too far in this. I think mm -hmm. we're, we're we're agreed, and and but we we've, we've talked about that uh, this sort of oppositional attitude between college faculty and the rest of America, uh, along with um, American pragmatism. Mm -hmm. Perhaps some of the culture war things going on in colleges that make so many headlines that I don't know that you and I really need to talk about them. The, uh, um, oh, I love this interview because all the other interviews, it's all they wanted me to talk about. <laughs> the, um, uh, well, you know, it may come up insofar as it needs to. The, well, we'll just reject it. The, right. <laughs> but, but I think what's actually most, what, what most attracted me to the book was the second half which is, okay, the liberal arts are in decline. What can we do about it? The, um, what would it take to revive the liberal arts? And in particular, you have this phrase that um, is very striking to me. Uh, you say you're interested in a truly American liberal education. Um, so what would it take to revive the liberal arts? And what would, it, what would a revived liberal arts that had this truly American shape, what would that look like? It begins with what we were talking about before, America, Americans being a, a nation of, of practicality, of utility. You mentioned Tocqueville. Mm -hmm. I mean, Americans don't dislike the beautiful. They just want the mm. beautiful to be useful. Yes. Right? Uh, it's a per we're never changing that, and I'm not sure we should even think of changing that. Uh, yes. Uh, so how can, how can the liberal arts show their usefulness, again, in two ways? to the student, to the person, to the individual, and to the culture, to the society, and to the country. We have failed as liberal artists, I hate that phrase, uh, <laughs> uh, failed as professors of the liberal arts uh, to show how it's good for us as individuals. Mm. Uh, oh, I mean, we go and we say, oh, you could, you could become, uh, you, could, you can major in, in, in English or major in philosophy or major in classics, and you, you can still get a, a good job in the aerospace industry. Well, that, that's baloney. Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, although there are very good jobs you could have, and uh, I remember when I was at the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, my secretary and I conspired to call uh, Ed the, the secretaries of the presidents of all the Fortune 500 companies and say, what did your boss major in? Hmm. And they all, except for I think for one who majored in a business administration or something, they all, now we're talking back in the early 80s, uh, that's a long time ago, uh, they all majored in history or English. Hmm. English was a, a great major, for, uh, some in classics, some, some in philosophy. Uh, they all had some segment of the liberal arts uh, that uh, I also say in the book, uh, uh, two people and I knew I was going to get in trouble, but I got trouble in the wrong way on this. Uh, two of the best Americans, you know, I'll get in trouble maybe here, I don't know, uh, that I can name, Martin Luther King and Anthony Fauci, <laughs> both had superb liberal arts educations. Mm. Uh, you know, what was, what was Fauci's major at Holy Cross? Classics. He was a Latin Greek scholar. Uh, what did uh, Martin Luther King major in? Well, he majored in theology, American history, and American political thought. Uh, uh, and with that, they became not only interesting men, great men, they became useful men. So mm -hmm. the, it's an American education, because I really want to talk about the usefulness of the liberal, liberal arts, not so you could get uh, you know, a job uh, right out uh, in in, you know, in, in engineering, you know, in medicine, although, you know, you are disbarred from no job by majoring in the liberal arts. Mm. It, it's not a, it, it, you just, it just don't expect that. Uh, I remember a student when I first, within the first week I was at St. John's, came up to me, a young lady, and said, this place is a fraud. I said, why? She said, you promised me that if I graduated from here, I could do anything. I found that I can't do anything. I, I went and all, I tried out for a job and they said, can you type? I said, of course. It took them three days to realize I have no idea what a keyboard looks like. <laughs> like so you know, no, you didn't prepare me for the world. It's not what we meant by preparing you for the world, young lady. Uh, but, uh, but so we, uh, we prepare you in different ways. We prepare you to think, we prepare you to use your imagination, we prepare you to ask questions, we prepare you to seek the, uh, to seek the truth rather than just uh, mm. uh, you know, absorb whatever your peers say. This is where parents, priests, and poets come in. Uh, but really, uh, the other, other P that is more, more dangerous is peers. Uh, yes, uh, and uh, and it's to be able to say, well, you, you know, you may be right, but I think I got to think about this for a while before I say yes to it, uh, and uh, and and that's important. Uh, I mean, to have a thoughtful person and to have a thoughtful citizenry, what what more could you want out of education? And that's a very American education, but. You know, so it's not just you know, a classical Greek kind of education where we educate the, the elites. We ain't educating the elites, we're educating thoughtful men and women, no matter where they come from or who they are. So given this perspective on things, the case that you make for how the liberal arts could help themselves by getting over their uh, allergy to utility and beginning to use that language in their service um, and beginning to actually measure themselves by that uh, reasonable standard. Um, what do you see as signs of hope that such an understanding of liberal education might uh, take wing again and that it might actually be put into practice? As I say in the book, you know, uh, if, if it's true that, the, that Irish monks saved civilization, hmm. anything is possible. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I once heard one of my teachers say, hope is a virtue. And I think you're demonstrating just <laughs> what he meant, right? That it, it, takes, it takes courage. <coughs> oh, it takes courage. Okay, what, uh, what, so what's out there and what's growing out there? Uh, I don't want to be too hopeful because I don't think 
Uh, I don't think the, I, the the liberal arts are certainly in decline. Mm -hmm. uh, they may have hit rock bottom for all I know, mm. uh, which would be good. I don't want them to you know do anything anything worse for, for themselves. Uh, and and I and I'm talking about a peculiar kind of usefulness, usefulness to lead a, a an uh, an interesting interior life, a productive exterior life. Not that it's useful for you to. Uh, uh, to get your first job in something you know that, that <coughs> strikes your fancy, uh, and 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 it's a lot of stuff that goes by the idea of liberal arts just ain't liberal arts. I'm sorry. Mm. I mean, people say, oh, I, you know, I'm majoring in the liberal arts. I'm taking a course in uh, abnormal psychology and uh, 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 South American literature, colonial, uh, pre-colonial South American uh, history, and. Uh, uh, and something on uh, on intelligent consumerism. Uh, okay, adds up to nothing. Adds up to absolutely ah. nothing. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, St. John's, we don't we we actually don't even call it the curriculum. We call it the program of studies. Yes. And it's a program of uh, that that's been fashioned by wise people to help you see the world in in both its 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 unity and its total complexity. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think that's the kind of utility we're looking at. OK, what are the signs of hope? Uh, so I mentioned St. John's. There are things that have been there for a while and are, are always there. Uh, St. John's, Thomas Aquinas College, uh, uh, lots of small uh, private and often religious colleges. Uh, they, they uh, to use uh, to coin a phrase, keep the flame alive. I think, mm. uh, and are, are and are, are worthy of real support. Uh, uh, other things uh, declined and are coming back beautifully. I've been an advisor to Assumption College in Worcester, Massachusetts, mm. uh, and with some real strong philanthropic help, have been able to put together uh, a college of liberal arts within the university. That's mm. a real college. Of, they call it arts and sciences, but that's okay. Uh, a real college of liberal arts uh, uh, within the w within the university. I'd say that because liberal arts includes sciences. You don't want to separate it out like they just like they're just visiting. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and then uh, if they could just get over their 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 sort of narrowness right now. That new University of Austin in Texas, uh, I mean, once they get, by that I mean if they get over the idea that, that a, a, a university is more than a debate society, uh, and if they start teaching you know, French grammar and uh, biology, it would, be a real, it would be a real good university. Uh, and, 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 and money's going to that and will continue to go to that. That's wonderful. Hmm. Uh, and then there were, you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned, I'm on the board of the Jack Miller Center. We have helped with our, with funds, set up centers mostly for the study of American political thought, American, uh, American history, uh, and civic education. Uh, we, we, have a, we have a cadre of a thousand professors, hmm. and these professors have now taught over a million students in the university. Now they're going in and teaching teachers hmm. uh, in, the, in the schools. That's a hopeful thing. Uh, uh, put all the politics of it aside uh, and, and all our, 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 our prejudices, to be honest, aside. Uh, if you talk to high school teachers who teach history or, or civics, uh, they want to do the right thing. They hmm. really do. They are extreme. They just don't know. They went to colleges of education, for God's sakes. They, they don't know what, what, who James Madison, what he was trying to do, uh, uh, what the problems and, 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 and promise of this country is. But they want to know, and they want to teach it. Uh, uh, high school teachers are men and women of goodwill. They're grade school teachers included in that. Uh, and we have to treat them as if they are. Uh, and uh, so, so that's it. Uh, see, Eric Brown's here. Eric is starting a, a program at, the, at William and Mary uh, on the principles of the American founding and American foreign policy. That's an 
that's a valuable, really valuable mm -hmm. thing to be doing uh, in a direction that most of us in political science say, uh, he, but he's also a St. John's graduate, so it's a, uh, uh, what else? Uh, uh, Robbie George is doing wonderful work at the Madison program. I mean, all of these are, are, are helpful. Uh, and, uh, and, and we're, at St. John's, we, we went in, uh, we went into uh, giving that Masters of Art and Teaching, uh, where we introdu introduced uh, teachers to the great books. And then now it's for everybody, adults. So a lot in adult education. And you say, well, that's too late. And that's just not true. It's certainly not too late. But mm -hmm. these people then become supporters of the liberal arts colleges. Uh, mm -hmm. Very important thing to do. Uh, uh, if I could only convince St. John's, Nora, you listening? If I could only <laughs> convince St. George that if, if you could offer a PhD that would actually make people smarter rather than stupider. Uh, uh, it would be a great blessing. Yeah. People, where well, you might learn, where well, you might actually become smarter about things that matter instead of narrower about things that don't matter. Uh, but I'm, I've been singing that song for 20 years and I'm failing. So, 30 years. Uh, that's a long winded answer. You don't need any more than that. Hey, um a couple of, uh, of, of last things before we um, take some questions from the audience. Well, thank you. I never had one of these. Before. I, 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 I guess they're switching you over from the, uh, from the, from the one to the other there. The, um, uh, you draw some interesting lessons about liberal education from your, um, your time in Iraq. And I think, well, I think there's, there's an obstacle here which is that I think for so many Americans born in the 1990s or the 2000s, they just want to, the Iraq war, it just seems a national catastrophe that they would just prefer not to think about. Uh, you draw some really interesting lessons from your own encounters over there. So how can those who are inclined to think of Iraq adventure in this way, how can they learn something from people who, who participated in this, in, this, um, in this enterprise? I went to Iraq at the behest of Don Rumsfeld, mm -hmm. whose wife was on the board of St. John's. Don Rumsfeld gave us, not only gave us an entree to a, uh, uh, to a foundation that gave us a $500,000 challenge grant, uh, but he, when I couldn't raise the money, wrote a personal check for five hundred thousand uh, dollars. Uh, so how did I get to Iraq? I get a phone call from Don from from Rumsfeld's office. The secretary wants you to go to Iraq. Be head of the uh, uh, Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. Uh, I said, really? Why? He said, it's payback time, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would not have given that up. It was dangerous. It wasn't fun. It was important. And it really was just an eye opener. The first eye opener was, uh, as a friend of mine says at Hampton, Sydney, nothing's better than giving education to post tyranny kids. Huh. Uh, that's, they, they are not blasé, ever. Uh, to them, learning Thucydides is really a matter of life and death. Uh, I, in fact, I mentioned in the book, uh, and this was in Kurdistan, some students coming up to me saying, you know, Dr. John, Dr. John, are you an Athenian or a Spartan? <laughs> what a nice question. I said, you know what? Well, you didn't ask me to ask me that. I hope I'm an Athenian. I want to be cultured and, and civilized and 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 uh, and intelligent and and witty and charming. And no, 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 Dr. John, Dr. John. We want to know uh, uh, if you're a Spartan, will you betray us the way the Spartans betrayed the the, the people in in, in, in Miletus? I, oh, that's it. <laughs> These people were learning from Thucydides something about human nature, foreign policy, the nature of war, 
the problem of religion, all of these things that they absolutely needed to know. Uh, and it wasn't just, oh, I guess it's going to be on the test. They wanted to know if Americans, they didn't mean me, they meant, um, are you Americans? Are you American Spartans or Athenians? Uh -huh. Then uh, the other thing I learned in, in Iraq, but this was previous when I first went in 2003, is not that we knew very little about Iraqi culture or about Iraqi politics. Or, that was a given. We knew we knew very little. Was how damn little we knew about what made America. Huh. Yeah. That was the that was the real problem. We were to, oh we're going to set up a, a democracy here, and and it's easy. We're going to get people to vote. <laughs> I'm sorry, tyranny is easy. Oligarchy, was, I mean, even aristocracy is easy. Democracy is the hardest thing in the world to huh. make. Absolutely the hardest. Uh, and uh, and and then. Uh, we asked all the wrong questions. We said, you know, don't all religions teach peace? Well, what a stupid question. Uh, the answer is no, not all religions do. Uh, don't, all, don't all people want to be free? No. Well, they certainly don't all want their neighbor to be free. Mm. Uh, and uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, they, they, they may not, they may have fear of freedom. Uh, as, I, as I said in the book that I mentioned, you mentioned before, uh, with the lovely uh, uh, neocon title of Mugged by Reality, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, there are people in this world who kiss their chains. They are, uh, they, they, uh, fear, of, fear of freedom is a, is, a real, is a real thing in the world. Uh, but we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, we'd have, we'd have slogans. Uh, we got to bring we got to bring all people to the uh, all stakeholders to the table. All stakeholders. Uh, you know we're talking about about criminal murderers. We're talking about fanatics. We're talking about anti semites. We're talking about people who are Arabs who can't stand uh, can't can't stand the Kurds. Kurds who are who who hate the Sun uh, hate the Sunnis. You bring all of them to the table. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. We have to represent all parts. Uh, you know, every faction gets gets. Uh, get, and so we broke up the government into ministries, and and this was the Sunni ministry. The Communist Party had the Culture Ministry. Uh, uh, my ministry, higher education, was in the hands of in the hands of uh, of the, of, uh, of a Sunni minister who was an absolute disaster, uh, and uh, and the regular education was in the hands of a of a Shiite minister. Uh, and, and the lesson of Federalist 10, that you have to break the power of faction, meant nothing to the State Department. Hmm. They didn't have a clue what that meant. Hmm. Break the power of faction? No, you represent factions. Well, there, were, there lies disaster. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, uh, hmm. and so we, uh, we, we, we screwed up in Iraq. There's absolutely no, no doubt about it. But we screwed up. Huh. The Iraqis didn't screw up half as badly as we, we did. We, we thought that, that, that voting, what, that's, we, that would be a, the democratic sign of purple thumbs. Everybody had purple thumbs because they voted. Uh, and uh, that's very nice. Uh, uh, when we first set up the voting system, uh, Ambassador Bremer wanted to have caucuses. Well, nobody knew what a caucus was. Uh, certainly the Iraqis didn't know and they had no interest. So then we went to regular voting and then we had party lists. That's how we did it, by party lists. Uh, no thought that, uh, A, that, that we wanted to do something to, to moderate the factionalism. No, we wanted to heighten the factionalism. We mm. wanted to sharpen it. Idiotic thing to do. And the second thing was, uh, we made vague uh, motions in this way, but we thought that politics governed w without realizing that culture governs as well, uh, that religions govern as well. I saw it as part of my job, and we, we failed because we had no support for it, to build up civil society. That's what you needed. You needed uh, you, ne you needed, uh, uh, you know, the American Medical Association. You needed the Boy Scouts. Uh, uh, you needed sports teams. You needed everything that makes people work together, uh, and so that the 
that the edges uh, get worn away. Now, it only works imperfectly here uh, because the whole Madisonian project broke down at the time of the Civil War when we became two factions. But that's pretty much what you have there, uh, Sunni Shia or, or, or Arab Kurd. Uh, and, uh, and we had uh, n no way of building up those parts of civil society that would moderate the, uh, uh, the, the factionalism of society. I have spoken much too much. That was a, <clears throat> that was a beautiful uh, illustration of the way in which a liberal education can inform one's political judgment. Right. So I think it's, I think it's splendid. We have um, just, a, just a little time left, so why don't we turn things over to questions from you all. Uh, Nicole Penn, down front here. Thank you so much for this fantastic uh, presentation. It was so wonderful to hear you discuss the value of a liberal education. I'm wondering, a lot of your focus here is on the traditional university, and I'm wondering if a source of hope for you might be, and perhaps an answer as we are in a position, in, in a state of, I think, transition for universities. I mean, they're facing real institutional challenges. And I'm wondering if you think there is a place, if there was a fantastic essay in the Atlantic a few years ago called Teaching Plato to Plumbers. So it's funny yeah. that you brought up plumbers. Yeah, yeah. And this was written by a professor at a community college. So I'm wondering what you think the future landscape, if it was up to you, could look like that perhaps breaks free from the current model of higher education that that structurally has a lot of problems, and if there is a way to democratize access to liberal education that combines the servile arts while also giving people access to the liberal arts. I, I, I wish I was smart enough to answer that question, to be honest. Uh, but I know what you're asking is, is true, that we, uh, it's not just the liberal arts that are dying. I mean, college enrollment's going down. Uh, uh, and, and we try to make it up by bringing in people from China and whatever, let's fill the ranks. Uh, uh, we do like we do at St. John's, bring in adults, so they'll fill the ranks. Uh, but there are, we know there are other ways of, of learning. Uh, I would hate to see colleges, especially small liberal arts residential colleges, go by the boards. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, Colleges have, have screwed themselves. They really have. Uh, I mean, why, why is it that, that everybody I know now belongs to a, uh, to a, a book club? Hmm. Uh, why is it that everybody listens to TED Talks on the radio? Uh, why, why is it that, uh, 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 that uh, while community colleges are not, are not doing great, uh, uh, they're not doing badly either? Uh, why is it that homeschooling has blossomed? Sometimes it's simply a disaster, but, but if we knew how to, how to help those who want to be helped in homeschooling, we could really do good things. Uh, I, I certainly want to, if you got ideas out there in the audience, tell her or tell me. Uh, <laughs> but, Nora? Actually, I don't want to turn this into a PR uh, for St. John's, yeah. but I can tell you that there is a group of liberal arts colleges, and St. John's is in the leadership of this, working with community colleges uh, to really bring the liberal arts into community colleges, and a number of them really have asked for them, because I think they're going through a huge transformation themselves, um, and certainly there is the you know concrete uh, physician training program, but a lot of their students also want to get that broader education. So yes, I'm happy to share more information with you about that if you're interested, but it is definitely going on because leaders on both sides understand the importance as Sean has been outlining. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jackie Merrill. Well, thank you for this wonderful talk. And I want to ask about the connection between two crises, um, the crisis of learning and liberal education and, and the crisis of men uh, in our society today. I mean, we see uh, um, you know, declining workplace participation in February 2020, even before the pandemic. Uh, the, according to Pew, the number of young men living at home hit 50%. Um, and you know, the, as you describe it, liberal education is a an education 
into what it means to be a person of honor, a person of excellence, a person of virtue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, is there a connection between the, the, you know, the death of learning and the decline of the liberal arts and the, the, the crisis of young men and their, their disinterest in higher education? I'm sure you're right. I've heard that. Do, do I know what's <laughs> how to unpack that and unravel it? Well, probably not. Uh, but I, I, I know that we've we've. Uh, it's it's odd. You would think so. You would think that. Uh, well, men are going to gravitate towards then. Uh, let's say mathematics. Well, as Nora would tell you, what women are gravitating towards mathematics in droves. Hmm. Uh, Science, technology, even you know, uh, you know, even the fields that we would think of. Well, if the liberal arts can't be masculine, at least the STEM su subjects can be. Uh, maybe not. Uh, I don't know what's causing the uh, not the the aversion to liberal education, but the aversion to becoming educated on the part of men. I don't know. Uh, uh, someone will have to educate me on this. I really don't know. <laughs> uh, Tim Carney. Thank you, Tim Carney, uh, St. John's class of 2000. Um, <laughs> you guys, uh, you had promised you were going to talk about uh, diversity and ah. multiculturalism, and you didn't. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Can you please talk about diversity and multiculturalism in liberal <laughs> education? When we were at St. John's, we thought, well, okay, why are they almost all dead white men? Well, maybe the, this program is literally packed to the gills with the literally objective greatest books uh, in the world, or at least that feed into Western civilization. So I is that true, or is there a way to become more multicultural and diverse without sacrificing the, the quality or the, or the value of the education? Yes, is the answer. Uh, next question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, one thing I learned from I got this from Werner Danhauser, one of my favorite professors ever, who would always say, you know, at, at its base, liberal education is necessarily multicultural. Uh, it's, I mean, there was an old uh, view that, you know, uh, the great march of civilization, everything led to this, led to that, this is what we were talking about before. Uh, there were fits and starts. There were, there were rejections, there were revolutions. Uh, the, have a, one of my first essays that I wrote uh, was uh, uh, Why Latin, Why Greek? And it was not because we're like, they, we're like the Romans only more grown up. Or more, you know, we're not like them. They had, a view, they had views that were uh, views, as Jackie was saying, you know, of honor and virtue and manliness that we can I, in fact, I knew a, a professor of a professor of Latin who hated teaching it because he hated the Romans. Uh, <laughs> they were not they were not him. Uh, he was he was soft and sweet and generous and kind and charitable and totally boring. Uh, uh, and uh, and so uh, uh, so yeah, so the idea of multiculturalism in the liberal arts is not only not new; it's it's foundational in a sense. Hmm. Okay. Uh, this doesn't mean that errors are not made along the way. As I, I mentioned in the book, and, and I, uh, I had one person uh, uh, on a right wing talk show say, You and Bill Bennett funded the Stanford University Multicultural Project. Are you ashamed of yourself? Uh, well, it didn't turn out the way we thought it would turn out, it didn't turn out anything like we thought it would turn out. Uh, uh, but we, when they promised to expand the the core curriculum to include more women authors and black authors or Hispanic authors, we said, okay, let's see what you can do. Little did we know that it was going to be that Western Civ had to go, and that they were going to set up different studies of you know black studies, women's studies, Chicano studies, uh, and. Uh, and, and that multiculturalism ultimately became the exact opposite of multiculturalism. It became little silos of learning uh, that which, if you're not careful, you'll be, uh, if you want to study this or that, you'll be said to be culturally appropriating. 
uh, uh, it, it, it did exactly the opposite of what we wanted it to do. Uh, but as, as Nora could tell you, St. John's has, uh, uh, the curriculum always expands at St. John's, uh, sometimes contracts a little. Uh, and, uh, and so can you, re are, there, are there important black authors in the curriculum? Yes. Are there important women authors in the curriculum? Absolutely yes. Uh, and, and they're not there because they're black or women or, uh, but because they write great books, they have great thoughts, they have important things to say, and they say it in ways that are compelling. That's why it's in there. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, no, the, the, uh, the thought that, that instead of expanding the Western canon, we would shut down the Western canon, uh, that was a serious, serious, and I think that was part of the beginning of the end as well of liberal education in the, in the American mind. Yeah. Oh, I know you got it. His story to say. Last, uh, we, have, we have time for one more. This guy will be able to say Yeah, Jake. Me. Thank you so much for a great talk. Uh, about your book. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in higher education policy uh, just about uh, what that value proposition of like a degree ends up being. And I think the liberal arts colleges and universities have uh, you know, granted degrees as sort of like a, a, the credential that you receive. Uh, and it's sort of like bridging the beautiful and the useful in, in, in a way to like make a labor market proposition. Um, but there's also been a lot of talk about credential transparency in kind of the higher education system. Uh, have you given much thought as to, you know, will, would a more transparent system of like what you get out of a liberal arts education aid or, or, or hurt kind of liberal arts? Colleges, universities, and professors knew what you could get out of a liberal <laughs> education. <Yeah. laughs> it would very much help if yeah. they could say it, defend it, and promote it. Mm. That would be wonderful. But I'm, I'm sorry, uh, and I don't mean to be totally down on professors. I've known a few of them, you know, Burns, Bloom, and Danhauser, who were very good, uh, <laughs> uh, extraordinary people, extraordinary, extraordinary minds. And, uh, but, uh, but. I was serious when I said uh, we're going to go from three Ps to four. I put the pro professors in as people who do, who don't have a clue often uh, what the liberal arts are, how to promote it, mm. uh, and part of this has to do with uh, with their training. I mean, we teach what we know. You go to graduate school. You you have you carve out for yourself not the world, not to know more about as many things of importance as you can, but to delve deep into one small thing. It's, it's, it works like a charm in the sciences. I mean, you wouldn't want medicine to be anything other than, in a sense, specialized. I want, I, 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 you know, that my doc, my heart doctor doesn't know about toenails, perfectly fine with me. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, we have so made uh, the, the, the training of PhDs narrow. PhD is then the union card to go teach at colleges and universities and sometimes in high school. We teach what we know and we wind up teaching our dissertations. Mm. We wind up teaching the narrowness of our fields. Mm. Uh, uh, I think, I think uh, PhD education in America is the great enemy of education in America. Mm. Mm. Well, with that, uh, we are we are a little uh, so overtime. It is an obituary I wrote. Right. <laughs>